Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, your guide to navigating the decentralized web. My name is Aaron Stanley, and today I'm joined by Jonathan Victor, ecosystem lead at Protocol Labs. We talk about the state of the Filecoin ecosystem three years after mainnet launch, and the path forward for turning Filecoin into a true marketplace for open data services. Great. So we're here today with Jonathan Victor of Protocol Labs. JV, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Amazing. So to get started, why don't you just tell us a bit about your journey into Filecoin, IPFS, and Protocol Labs? How did you get involved in all of this? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I guess so. Uh, rewind to 2016. Um, I had been working at another company outside of Web3, and this was sort of like when Ethereum and all were popping off. And I remember at the time not really understanding it. Like I had heard of Bitcoin back in 2013, like there was that run up and people were freaking out about it. At the time, didn't understand Bitcoin, sort of lost interest. Uh, but in 2016, uh, the company I was working for, one of the people who was on my team, he was super into Ethereum. He had lost money in the DAO hack, but he was still super excited. And so as things were sort of heating up again, um, I was like trying to understand more about what was getting everyone else so excited. And since I was doing a lot of these like consulting flights between countries, um, I just was reading as many white papers, listening to as many talks, trying to like understand what was getting everyone else so excited. And I basically walked away with like two conclusions. Um, the first was that smart contracts were really interesting from a theoretical perspective. Like we've built this new primitive that we haven't really seen before. Um, but it was also clear to me that there weren't like super obvious use cases. A lot of the things that were sort of being pitched during the ICO era that might have sounded kind of good on paper or very speculative on paper, but like it didn't really resonate with me as much as like the core smart contract idea. So it was like, cool, we've built something unique, not super obvious what the use cases are. Um, but in that time in doing that research, I came across a talk that Juan, who's the founder of Protocol Labs, a talk that he gave about IPFS. Now, the company I was working for was doing a lot in distributed systems. So the way that they built software, it was meant to be deployed for people who are in super remote regions, things disconnected from the internet. And reading the IPFS white paper, it instantly clicked in terms of like what IPFS might mean for the internet at large, where instead of saying like, hey, we're going to make the internet depend on these centralized links, uh, where if you lose connectivity to a specific server or someone blocks your access, you no longer can access content. Instead, we can build the internet to have sort of these resiliency properties just by leaning in to sort of like the distributed nature that it has inherently. And that sort of stuck with me. And it was like outside of Ethereum at the time, like the only other thing I was really tracking was like the IPFS, like Filecoin sort of story. And then I guess like between 2016 and 2019, it was something that like every now and again, I would check in on uh, and like just see what was going on. Um, but then in the middle of 2019, I'd been at my last job for about four and a half years at that point. And so it was just a moment of, I've been there for a while. Is it really the place that I want to be long-term? Or are there other sort of like big things that I think are worth working on? Um, so that interest in protocol lab slash IPFS, that was sort of there. So that was like one of the three things I was looking at. So I had a bucket of like Web3 and protocol labs, honestly, was the only thing in that bucket for me. Um, uh, there was alternative energy. So looking at like renewable sources of energy, I was looking at like lithium sulfur batteries is one thing. Um, and then vertical farming was like the other sort of like big bet. And so for each of these, it was like in the next 10 years, what do I think are things that are going to matter? And like, uh, yeah, after talking to the different teams, I just really clicked with the people I met at protocol labs. Like two of my four interviews ended up being philosophical debates about like, what does it mean to build an uncensorable web? Like, is that actually a thing that we want to like manifest into the world? And like, what are the real properties that you want if you're trying to build something that can like better encode civil liberties into like the software stack? Um, so to me, that was like sort of like how I knew it was like, this is the place I want to go. Um, and I've been here ever since. Um, so yeah, at Protocol Labs, I've gotten to work on basically all parts of Filecoin. Um, so I started out as a research PM working on Filecoin's proofs. Um, so this was before Filecoin launched. Um, I switched gears and helped launch a number of products, which were like storage on ramps. Uh, so NFT storage and Web3 storage, I was like the founding PM for both of those products. Um, then after that, uh, started working on like collaboration things, just helping people onboard into the ecosystem. So like OpenSea, Rarible, Magic Eda, and different people who were trying to build things during like the bull run. Um, and then I'm sure we'll talk about this later. Um, me and my colleague HQ, we started a team called TLDR, which was just taking a step back to try to like better synthesize what's going on in the Filecoin like ecosystem. So that people who are coming up for the first time trying to understand 
how to like navigate the ecosystem, what are sort of like the big bets that the ecosystem is making, like we can distill that because Filecoin is a very technical project and it's really hard to track from the outside. Yeah, absolutely. No, you guys are doing some really great work on the on the TLDR front. It's a really great resource. I think we'll have some links to those uh, in the notes here as well. Uh, but I find it really interesting that your your journey into uh, into this all like, I mean, you 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 kind of you know you it's kind of you know similar to other people where it's like okay, you see it, and you're like, what is this? And then you do a little bit more research, kind of gradually go down the, go down the rabbit hole. Uh, but you immediately clicked with the idea of like, okay, smart contracts are a thing we need to pay attention to. But then also you're looking at it really from like distributed systems perspective of, of like you read the IPFS white paper, it really clicked with you. And you're like, okay, this is something that's going to be like a component of the internet of the future. If really, we really want it, if we're really thinking about this from a distributed systems vantage point. And, uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily like, there's no token involved with IPFS, right? So it's not like, oh, there's a token that I can, you know, that somehow will make everybody rich or whatever. This was, stri you're strictly looking at this from kind of like a philosophical and technical standpoint. And that's how you ended up at feels very in line with like the protocol labs mindset, I suppose. So <laughs> I guess I'm not surprised <laughs> to hear you elaborate on it. I feel like I'm, like everybody I meet at protocol labs is like, is, is kind of approaching it from that uh, perspective, which is super cool. Um, and, you know, so and appreciate the overview. It seems like you've, you've had your, your kind of your hands or your, your tentacles of sorts involved in like so many different areas of the Filecoin IPFS ecosystem that you have such a, you have a really great, like just overview of uh, not only a like what all this stuff actually is and how it works, but uh, also in terms of like explaining this to other people, whether it be from other ecosystems or other teams. And a lot of this is the work that you're doing with the TLDR side now with HQ. And I'd love for you to just maybe give us kind of like a brain dump uh, on, you know, really just like how you kind of articulate the the, 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 the Filecoin IPFS like roadmap uh, and value proposition when you're dealing with like different stakeholder groups. Like I know you've been talking to a lot of different investors and, and VCs and things of that nature, really helping them to kind of better understand what's going on here in the ecosystem. And, or even if it, when you're just talking to, you know, folks from different ecosystems who, um, you know, they, they've, they've heard of Filecoin, they generally understand what it is, but they don't really understand sort of the 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 breadth and the ambition of the project, but would love to just kind of get a brain dump for you from you on how uh, on just how you kind of communicate these ideas to different stakeholder groups. Sure, yeah. So I would say like the way I think about it is there's a bunch of bets that like IPFS and then more broadly Filecoin are making um, about how we think like the internet's going to evolve and like systems are going to evolve, and I think it's best to sort of start maybe from IPFS and then you can sort of back into like why Filecoin stuff. Um, IPFS is really this bet that the internet should have been built uh, with content addressing as sort of like the core primitive. Um, so for folks who don't really understand what content addressing means, uh, normally when you have like a URL, so you have like that thing in your browser, you're going to a specific location. So you'll go to like johnsdropbox.com slash JPEG1. And that's literally like resolving to some machine, some computer somewhere on the internet and saying like, go into this folder structure to find this file, which is like kind of bananas when you think about it. Like that's not how you think about people. Um, if you were to like reference a human based on like where they work or where they live, that's like definitely one way you could do it. But of course, if that person moves or if like that person is in the office or not at home, then it doesn't give you or a different person is there. Like you don't have enough specificity to know that that's like, the person you're looking for. And so the big idea with IPFS is instead of referencing things based on where they are, we reference things based on what they are. So we use like a fingerprint, we call it a content hash of the content itself. And so the analogy I've used sometimes is if you think about it like a book, um, instead of me telling you to go to a library to find the book, I instead tell you like, here's the ISBN number, here's the cover art, here's like the page count, the author, et cetera. And then you could ask me for the book, they could ask you, Aaron, for the book. You could ask your friends for the book. And even if those people don't have it, they could ask one layer out, like their friends. And whoever has a copy of the book, you can check that it matches the description. And if that's the right description, great, you're done. If not, you can just keep asking. And now you're no longer dependent on going to a single library to say like, hey, is this book still here? You could just get the closest copy of the book wherever that thing resides. Um, so like now you can sort of see that like so long as there's a copy of the book and someone that you know has some pathway to it, you can get it. Like that's sort of like the big idea with IPFS. And there's a number of reasons why we think that's super important. So like there's a couple of trends that are kind of happening in the background, um, but like you can sort of see them and like 
it honestly in the last year, you probably have felt them a little bit more. Um, so as people think about like the improvements in hardware, so like the amount of computing that you have, we say at the edge or like the far edge, um, far edge being like the device that you have, like your laptop is better now than it was a decade ago, as is your iPhone. Um, if you think about uh, in terms of like data generation as well, like the amount of data that you are creating or that you want to process, whether that's your personal data as you generate more and more, whether that's like AR and VR, so like these heavier assets that people want to ship, um, so you can have hyper-realistic things for the metaverse, um, whether that's like, yeah, the high quality video or games or whatever, like data generation is going up. And so if you combine these two trends and look at the improvement of bandwidth, which is an improving at the same rate, you basically have this sort of implication that you'll want to be able to do more stuff like local on users' devices. So the bet with IPFS is like, look, if hardware is improving, you can do some more stuff on users' devices. If data generation is going up, it's going to be more expensive to ship that thing back to the cloud to do some sort of processing, um, and it's going to be slower. And so like, if we could build the internet and build applications in a way where you can like reference the data, even if it's sitting on a user's device, you could build applications that are faster because they don't have to move data around. They could be more private because you don't have to like share it with a third party necessarily. Um, you can also have it work in offline conditions. So you get all of these superpowers basically for free. Um, so that's like the short version of the IPFS sort of like story. Um, but it also sort of like opens up the story for the Filecoin question as well. Because like if you sort of bought all of that slash followed it, like the thing that IPFS is saying is like we can build applications where we don't need data to sit on a central server. Like it doesn't have to necessarily be shipped to Amazon to process or to Google to process, et cetera. You could just use your own devices. Now, software engineers or people listening, they'll probably say like, well, you don't always want to do everything on a local user's device. What's if we wanted to like, I don't know, do some aggregation across every user listening to this podcast? Um, well, you might want to collect that into some third party computer to go do some work. Um, and that might be the cloud, like one sort of like pathway the world could go is that we still use the hyperscalers for things like that. Hyperscalers being Amazon, Google, Microsoft. But another question is, look, if we are using content addressing, like what is the cheapest way that we can get these services sort of like offered, um, like across the total market of all data centers. And like, this is really what Filecoin is actually targeting, which is like, look, once you have content addressing as like the base way that we reference data on the internet, like. The next question is like, what is the most efficient way of delivering these services? And if we can create a market of like hardware providers, whether that's like data centers uh, that are offering storage, whether that's the retrieval nodes that are offering sort of like the CDNs, like if you can build truly open permissionless markets, you can compete that cost of service all the way down and basically get to like the most efficient thing um, possible. It's just sort of like the Falcon bet. Yeah, and, and that ties into a lot of, um, you know, if, if folks have, have watched any of Juan's talks recently, you know, he talks a lot about how, you know, with any new technology and specifically with, with you know, kind of the evolution of cloud storage, like it, it took really like 30 years for cloud storage to really get to the point where it was or kind of like Web2 cloud storage, I guess we would call it, to be to the point where it really becomes this dominant force where they had not only a superior product, but they were also able to offer it at, you know, uh, prices that were cheap enough to get uh, folks involved. Uh, or folks to be begin migrating over and using these services. And then there's all these other kind of additional services that are being uh, kind of layered on on top of just the storage, right? I think that's always kind of been the vision of Filecoin. Um, though I think I think sometimes people think of Filecoin as just being like a storage solution, right? It's like a Dropbox for, you know, you know, Web3 native version of Dropbox or something. I store my photos and whatever, but there's so many. But I like the way you frame it as far as like open data services, essentially. We're really rebuilding like a marketplace for data services. And... I'd love for you to kind of talk through at least, you know, your, your interpretation of, of like, uh, of Juan's master plan, kind of the three, the three stage, uh, the, you know, the storage or the hardware, the, the, you know, the, the storing the data and then the compute, uh, elements of the, of kind of the file coin master plan and how that builds off of, of kind of the value proposition you were just describing. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, like the thing I described is sort of like a motivation of like why file coin is like a concept should exist. It's really just a bet that like, if you can solve the technical and software problems, like markets will be more efficient than like centralized incumbents because like cloud services tend to actually have some sort of like locality advantages uh, and also just costs in an open market. So by locality, what I mean is like, 
if I can keep my data closer to you, like in a CDN, I can offer it, like I can serve it faster. And that's just like a physical advantage because the, the speed of light is like the limiting constraint on how fast you can move data. And like, if I'm closer to you, like there is a certain speed at which even if like, yeah, you tried to send it faster, like the speed of light will stop you. Um, and so, yeah, like when Juan is talking about the master plan, he's actually sort of like, uh, like you could frame it as a master plan. You could also think of it in terms of like the causality or like what you need in order to enable the other stuff. So in order to acquire, like the first step has to be acquiring hardware. Um, and that's pretty straightforward because like there's one network effects to having like a large amount of hardware, um, like hardware sort of begets more hardware. Um, and you want like the incremental provider to sort of like align to like the largest stack. Um, but two, it also gives you the substrate to like upgrade. Um, so when we think about like all the protocol improvements to the Filecoin network, like that's something that if you thought of it like Tesla as an analogy, you're like shipping upgrades like over the airwaves uh, to each of these like different data centers. Um, and like the larger base that you have, the more improvements that you sort of get out of that. Um, as things like computer for data, as people improve like the storage side, as like retrieval services come online, like if you have hardware that's sort of like able to accept those upgrades, that increases sort of like uh, the surface area of like the offerings that you can actually like give to the real world. Um, so like why hardware first? Uh, it's really because it gives you a substrate more than anything else. Um, so then the next question is like, okay, so that's step one. Step two, like you basically want to like make that hardware useful. So start adding in data. Um, people sort of think that Filecoin is designed to well, I don't know if people think it, but you'll hear it every now and again. Filecoin today is more like archival storage. That isn't like necessarily out of like a specific desire to be hardware storage. It's actually a function of using Filecoin's proofs to sort of like uh, basically help acquire hardware. So like if you look at Filecoin's tokenomics, it really rewards uh, storage providers who bring capacity into the network. Um, it's able to do that because we're using these like zero knowledge proofs in order to like verify the hard drive capacity um, or the hard drive like allocation that's in the network. Um, so that proof process is what sort of like makes Filecoin sort of target archival storage. And so a lot of the effort, especially in this sort of like phase two of the master plan has been looking at like, what are use cases that benefit? Um, so like, if you look at, we're at the, looking at the intersection between like what Filecoin does today and like, what are the use cases in the world? These actually tie together in a really nice way or archival data tends to be quite large and we have quite a large amount of capacity that we want to like sort of fill up. So there's like a natural sort of like synergy between the two. Um, so that's sort of like step two, which is like make the, like seed as much data into the network as you can. Um, and in another way, that's like adding another layer to the substrate where you're saying like, First, I have empty hard drives, then I fill up the hard drives with stuff. And it, now the two of those give you something that you can make more useful with step three, which is like add more services. So when we say add more services, this is like, cool. What are the things people actually want to do with the cloud? That could be like the hot storage side. That could be the retrieval markets with CDNs. That could be compute. That could be databases. It's really just saying like, once you've got this data onboarded onto the network, once you build up more services, there's two things that you get. Thing number one is you get compounding. So like uh, once you have like a compute protocol that's running on top of these data sets that are already seeded onto the network, well, the cheapest place to store the new data set that's generated after that compute is on the hard drives that are sitting right next door. Um, you don't have to ship it to like some other location. It's just like the easy upsell is to add more capacity or like add more data sets into the network. Um, the same is true for retrieval. Uh, if you build up like basically like open channels between a retrieval network and the storage network, like you can have the retrieval network eject extra state or like extra data into the Filecoin network for more like storage. Um, you can also read back out so you can increase the effective amount of data that you can serve. Um, so I think like to sort of summarize like the, the master plan, really the first two steps are building up a substrate where it's like first add all of this hardware. Um, Second, add data into the hardware. Um, and then third is like make that data more useful. And as you're layering all more, more of these services, you're building up sort of these like network effects between uh, sort of like the different offerings that exist. And hopefully that leads to more like compounding usage between like the various components of like the Filecoin ecosystem.
So we're coming up on the third anniversary of the Filecoin mainnet launch, and you've been around for all three of those years. You've even been around for uh, a couple of years leading up to the mainnet launch. And uh, just given your vantage point on on just you've been involved in so many different parts of the ecosystem here and, and, and the product side and the ecosystem building side, we just love your your kind of thoughts on like what's been the most maybe like rewarding component of of being in this ecosystem and, and what have what have maybe been like the parts where you're like, wow, like that actually worked. Like that was, that's, that's a pretty like significant achievement. And uh, maybe, and what have you maybe found just most like personally rewarding about, about being a part of this? Yeah. I mean, so uh, I guess like the thing that's been most exciting over the last call it like four and a half years has been sort of like the community that's built up. Um, There's some really hard problems that as an ecosystem we're trying to tackle. And I think, there's many other things people could go work on. And I think like the most impressive part is finding other people who are like willing to sort of like take a bet. Uh, Cause like, honestly, like every, everyone in this ecosystem is effectively a startup. And so it's like people who are sort of like collectively trying to make this thing work in various forms. Um, I think it's interesting even to see how people who like inside of our community who have drifted off to other communities still figure out how to like build bridges and connections Um, as an example, uh, like the guy who, or one of the leads of Fire Dancer, this guy, Richard Patel, uh, like he was, I think the first contractor <laughs> that I had hired. Uh, and like, you see his little fingerprints all over like the early parts of like Filecoin's like wallet stuff. Um, but he leading Fire Dancer, like he had the idea of basically using content addressing to help with like Solana's archiving to create sort of like these verifiable hashes of different parts of their state that also kicked off sort of like a relationship to help start archiving Solana's like large amounts of data onto the Filecoin network. And I think that only really happens when you're able to like build up these relationships as a community. We also have folks like the Glyph team, like Jonathan Schwartz in 2019, it was like a dev shop of two. He and a buddy basically were like the first developers building a web wallet for the Filecoin ecosystem because we needed something to work with like ledgers. Um, And that basically birthed like what currently is like the leading DeFi protocol in the ecosystem. And so I think it's really impressive just to see like, and these are just like two point examples, but like you see more and more of these teams were like coming out of the woodwork, but have stuck around through like thick and thin. And I mean, especially in a bear market, I think all things can be like much harder than they are in a bull market, but it's exciting to see the people who continue to ship and continue to like actually push for like this sort of like vision of a decentralized future. So maybe on that note, could you tell us a bit more about like just the state of kind of cross uh, ecosystem collaborations and how is Filecoin like, really kind of collaborating or working with other Web3 ecosystems. Uh, you mentioned the Solana point earlier. Um, we'd love to get some more color on just like how that's all working and maybe what other, other teams, what other ecosystems are, are kind of involved here and uh, maybe even tie in some some uh, Filecoin virtual machine projects as well, uh, if you'd like. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, if you zoom back, I guess in 21, 21, 22, uh, like the way that Filecoin was working with other ecosystems is mainly as sort of like just pure storage. Um, So you saw it with like uh, NFT storage and Web3 storage and just things that made it easier for teams that were like minting NFTs or building applications that just needed to like store data in another place. Um, That was sort of like the primary way people were interacting with Filecoin. I think a couple of things have changed uh, in like the more recent months, which is pretty interesting. Um, One is there's more uh, projects that have large scale data needs. Um, So Solana is like one uh, just because like their state continues to grow. Um, But over and above Solana, uh, you could look at like sort of like the deep end world as there's more teams that are basically generating like large amounts of data, both from their video and sensor data. you also see it from things like data availability layers, folks who basically like after 30 days are looking for somewhere to push the archives of their data. And like Filecoin having these proofs is like actually a really nice place to store the data. And plus with the FEM, people are working on things like contracts that say like, hey, just make sure there's always n copies of this data on the network. And you can verify that those data sets are there with like the proofs that Filecoin natively offers. Um, So I think like there's something interesting in terms of like how there's been an evolution. Um, I think there's also something interesting in like the use cases that sort of seem to be more top of mind now that are out of the bull cycle and into a bear cycle uh, and some of the like newer themes that are sort of heating up. Uh, But I think also equally as interesting is like the FEM and what that unlocks Um, on the data side, I think sort of like 
giving Filecoin more flexibility and more primitives, I think makes it more interesting for other projects. It also means that you can do stuff like saying, uh, this is like a hypothetical, but like being able to say like, I want to use Solana staking as an example to fund the ongoing storage in perpetuity of the data on the Filecoin network. Like that's actually something that you could build now that we have the FEM and we have bridges and things like that. And so I think there's actually like a fair amount of like new capability that the network has that's making it easier to collaborate with other ecosystems. And of course, now that we have the FEM and we have like an on-chain economy that's sort of building up, we're seeing more with like other communities, like even that typically wouldn't have needed to work with Filecoin as much, like the DeFi community um, starting to like look at Filecoin as well. So there was like recently a vote from Uniswap to deploy on the FEM. There's a few other AMMs that are sort of, I've heard of at least are in the works um, that are deploying as well. And so I think we're starting to see sort of like Filecoin like grow its own offering set um, and finding more ways to sort of like plug more natively into like the broader Web3 community. Okay, that's super interesting. Um, and then just maybe talking about FBM in general here, uh, it's been a little bit more than six months since since it was launched back in March, but how would you kind of describe like the state of the FBM ecosystem right now? It's obviously early days, but like what, where have, where's been the most activity and where, where's, where have we seen kind of the most uh, interest in terms of just like new products, new applications, new use cases, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say like the first wave of applications that I think have gotten like the most traction on the FBM uh, are probably uh, like the DeFi protocols. Uh, so Filecoin's pretty interesting in that it doesn't have what you would traditionally think of staking, but it's kind of staking-like. It has this notion of collateral. And so for most storage providers who are on the network, if they want to grow their operations, if they want to like store data, they basically need to like lock up collateral in order to like offer capacity into the network and earn block rewards. Um, so teams that recognized this early started building solutions that you might, the closest analogy for like an Ethereum or something would be a Lido. Um, but these look pretty different to like the Lidos of like the Ethereum world, um, just because like Filecoin as an economy is kind of different. So like teams that are building effectively like services for the miners to allow them to basically like borrow fill in order to like run their operations. There's folks who are looking at like stable coin things. So if miners are getting, or if the storage providers are effectively earning dollar denominated like cash flows uh, from like offering storage services, how do you enable sort of like lending on top of that sort of like a real world assets -y sort of thing? Uh, I think there's teams that have been looking at things like derivative products as well. So if there's like uh, teams that are uh, looking to sort of like manage their own risk, uh, there's offerings there. Um, so, I mean, these are all just like, what is the community building? I think there's like a pretty wide range that you see. Um, I think what makes this pretty fascinating is a lot of this really just stems from like, who are the users of the network and like, what are the problems that they have? I think if you were to ask a new L1, like, I don't know, like, how are you going to attract a community? Or like, if especially if teams are like focused on just NFTs and DeFi, I think a new L1 starting today has a massive uphill battle to fight trying to acquire users from like, existing incumbent networks that already have like strong communities, strong network effects and so on. I think what makes Filecoin kind of differentiated is like there's this core economic loop, which is just like totally orthogonal to the most of Web3, which is like, look, people pay for storage services. That's like a thing that matters. And like, hopefully as we build compute, if we add retrieval, like you'll have more of these economic loops that are sort of like centered more on the Filecoin economy. And so like there is a home for a differentiated type of DeFi uh, which is like enabling those capital loops uh, between those like market participants. Um, so I think like we're definitely seeing a lot of enthusiasm from the builders on that side. Um, but I think equally as interesting are the teams that are looking at how do we combine these primitives together to start enabling other things. Um, so like folks who are working on building storage endowments, it's really like looking at how do you take the DeFi stuff, take the like data primitives and tie these two things together um, there's some folks that have looked at things like allowing people to monetize their data. Um, so like if you build sort of like a data DAO where you get like some sort of revenue slice when data is retrieved out of it, you can effectively do some form of permissioning. There's teams that are looking at like uh, sort of just like the perpetual storage uh, type use cases for like auto renewing indefinitely. Um, I think you're just seeing a lot of like experimentation because it's like a new primitive set that's really just being unlocked. Got it. Got it. And that's super interesting. And 
and, and kind of like, you know, piggybacking off on that question and, and maybe just extrapolating that to like the broader Filecoin ecosystem in general. Uh, but what do you see as kind of like, you know, we've accomplished a lot these first three years, but like, what do you see as, you know, from your vantage point, like where are the, where kind of like the, the, you know, the, the areas really need to kind of build, you know, continue building and, and really, you know, invest more resources into what are some of the big challenges that we've got to kind of overcome here in the next, uh, you know, 12, 18 months or whatever, you know, assuming that we're, 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 we're staying in a bear market for the foreseeable future. What are, what are some of the, um, you know, what are the things that we have to get built and get shipped here? Yeah. So like, I think one of the most interesting questions is really just like, how do you build the most amount of like network flows into the economy or like value flows into the economy? And to me, I think the shortest path is really just looking at what are the things that we have today and what requires like the fewest upgrades Historically, the way that uh, a lot of storage providers have won deals has been kind of point to point. It's like a single storage provider basically is doing everything from business develop development to like onboarding to sort of like the actual storage themselves. I think we're actually seeing a little bit of specialization take form. There's more teams now that are trying to like play more in like the front end and like the onboarding role rather than just like being a full stack integration. And then they're just really trying to like open up their backend to a marketplace of storage providers. So teams like Banyan as an example, teams like Ghost Drive is another, another example. Folks that are really just saying like, how do we make it easier for this to get like consumer adoption where people can just like pay for services and be able to like basically use or scale out with Filecoin as a backend. Um, I think those are pretty exciting, and especially for things like Banyan, where they're taking a little bit more of like an enterprise -y tilt to it, where they've leaned in super hard in using like UCANs and WinFS to like add an encryption and an Apple story. Like those are the types of features that enterprises actually need um, in order to like underwrite these sorts of things. I think working also with like a subset of miners that have been like SOC 2 certified, I'd like all of these things, I think, add up to like, how do you actually bring Filecoin to enterprise markets where like taking this cheaper offering of storage um, and just like making it available to them, I think is like pretty compelling. Um, so I think like on a price point, I think, oh yeah. Oh, I just wanted to kind of pause on that. And, and you know, I, I think this kind of evolution toward, you know, this really being, you know, really being like kind of an enterprise uh, offering in some, or an enterprise, you know, <laughs> really toward emphasizing like uh, enterprise use cases and enterprise adoption. And we've had, it seems like the enterprise adoption is like, it's there, but it kind of, it's there in like kind of, you know, maybe kind of like one-off increments, I guess. And, um, yeah. or, you know, we've, we've got like, we've got the CERN deal. We've got, you know, some, you know, in the, in the, you know, kind of the science and research institution areas, we've got some different deals. Uh, we've got a few other kind of like one-offs here and there that are, that are, you know, using, you know, at least using for archival storage at, at the very minimum. Um, but like, you know, specifically on this question of like getting, you know, obviously like with enterprise adoption, like this is where we're going to get data onto the network is through is through enterprise adoption. So maybe just talk a bit about like, just how are you thinking of it in terms of like, what are the problems that need to be solved to like really enable this, this uh, broader enterprise adoption? Yeah, I mean, there's like a number of things. I think, uh, honestly, some of the, the first order or first round of problems to solve are the simplest. Simplest, I guess, in like name only. Um, they're like hard problems, but they're like tractable. So a good example is like a lot of enterprises, if you go into a room with the CIO, they're going to have a set of questions around like what sort of security standards and so on. And I think like this is maybe a call to action for storage providers where like there are teams that are willing to do sort of like the issuing of verifiable credentials uh, that would like be your SOC 2 certification, but in a way that other people could discover. Like that sort of stuff actually is really important. Um, so like Ernst & Young is one of these teams. Uh, I think the DSA is working on bringing on more providers uh, that can sort of like offer that as a service. Um, but especially if you go talk to like the onboarding teams, so folks like the Banyans of the world, like the more storage providers that fit into that profile, the faster that they'll be able to like offer like their services with like a wider array of backend providers. Um, so I think it's like, there's separate problems where like, on the storage provider side, I would say like the call to action is like start leaning into like getting these things like these certifications, looking at like what are the offerings that the teams that are onboarding need. Um, it's not even just like onboarding is one side of it. There's also another set of teams that's looking at just how do we monetize the GPUs of the Filecoin network for AI companies. Many miners have like thousands of G like hundreds to thousands of GPUs and like uh, there are sort there are like AI companies that just need cheaper compute. 
And so being able to like bring the Filecoin market uh, basically to the AI boom <laughs> is like an opportunity for us to be on the picks and shovel side uh, rather than being like, uh, that's like the traditional Web2 sort of like pitch of like they want to invest in the picks and shovels. Um, and so I think there is like a bunch of these like opportunities that as an ecosystem we can capture, but a lot of it is really just around like both an awareness issue. So like people getting hooked up with folks like the IONet folks, the Jensen folks, the teams that are actually like working on monetizing these GPUs, hook up, hooked up with like the Banyan type people who are working on sort of like the hot storage and like the actual like permissioning and ACL stuff that people will need for like storing the data. Um, and especially these teams like working together so that you can bring both of them to market and just offer a single offering to like the mid journeys of the world and whoever. Like to me, that's like actually the biggest lever that teams have in the next 12 to 18 months. If we want to say like, how do you like flip a switch and turn on like massive cash flows? Because like someone like the Binions or the Ionets, like for them, they can focus on like go acquire enterprise customers. The thing that storage providers need to do is just like be like inside of this shape box in order to be a part of the deal flow that's going to come through. And I think like that to me is like where there's an opportunity where like instead of every team trying to focus on, I don't know, all parts of the puzzle of like, how do we pitch ourselves all the way through to the CIO? There's definitely, I feel like economies of scale of saying like, hey, let's get some teams who are focused on like enterprise onboarding. Let's accelerate those folks and make sure that they're able to like do the thing, expand as quickly as possible, build the widest funnel. But then also uh, for the storage providers, like making sure that they're ready to like offer standard offerings across like the different onboarding platforms. So like as more teams, so like Seal Storage is another team that has an onboarding platform. So like as Seal Storage and like Banyan and some of these other teams, if they all come up with relatively standard offerings, it'll be easier also for storage providers to plug in across those. Um, so I think there's just sort of like this, we're in like a messy middle, I think, where like we have a lot of these like point solutions, which are really exciting. But I think if we want to scale, we need to get to like some level of standardization so that it's just like easier for people to like play across many of these different markets and make it easy to, uh, to like grow. Yeah, that's super interesting. And, and, and if I'm understanding you correctly, it's, it, it almost sounds like the like the, the traditional model of a Filecoin storage provider has basically been like, you know, it's like it's like the, the, you know, the, the Ford, you know, Ford auto plants of like the early you know 20th century where it's like fully you know, vertically integrated, like we do everything in house, we, we store the data, we prep the data, we, we have all the hardware, we do, you know, we do all the business development. But you're what you're saying is like, there's a lot of opportunities for basically like, like kind of breaking out some of these tasks and these functions, just allowing different uh, teams to specialize on like just doing the business development or just, uh, just focusing on the hardware, just focusing on the data preparation, or just focusing on, uh, you know, on the compute aspects. And then and also thinking about what are some other clever ways that we can use that, that we can potentially monetize the assets that we have? So it's like, okay, we, we're sitting on this mountain of GPUs and like, who, who are people that need GPUs right now? It's like, well, all these, all these AI companies do. So how can we, you know, kind of, you know, just you know, going back to our earlier conversation about like, okay, we've got this mountain of hardware. Like what are some ways that we can, we can redeploy this. Um, and then maybe, um, I mean, this is, this is a question I get a lot just from, just from various people across crypto, but like is, and I mean, going going into kind of like the folks kind of like the B two C side, like the like the retail consumer side of like you know, it's a question we get a lot is like, oh, like you Filecoin, it's like Web three, it's storage for like Web three, like it's do I can I is it like a Dropbox? Can I just store all my stuff on there? Like how how does it work? Right, where most of our use cases right now are really more kind of like enterprise focused. Um, but what do you see as being kind of like the consumer? Like how can like a retail consumer like myself or or whoever? end up kind of like interacting with, with Filecoin. Is that, is that, is that even really a priority right now? Uh, that creating that type of, uh, those types of applications at this point. Um, so there are teams that are building this sort of offering. Um, so for what it's worth, I think Banyan might have one. I think like Chainsafe has one. Um, I think there's Ghost Drive as well. <laughs> I think it's important to have those things. Um, I think it's more important to like have the underlying primitives more. Like what really matters is like, look, as a network, I would argue, this is just my opinion at least, like in a bear market, the most important thing is like, how do you drive like, like the most amount of cash flows uh, into the ecosystem? And like, in whatever form that takes, right? Like, I think consumer honestly is like a very exciting opportunity because as I sort of said at the beginning, I think there's like 
a general thesis about like consumer data growing. And like, you can see, even see it in terms of like how many content creators are there in the world and like, what must their storage bills look like as they continue to like add more and more. And like, yeah, I mean, I think there is a go-to-market and like specific offerings people can build that would be like exciting and viable businesses. Um, So I would encourage those teams to like think about that stuff. I think for like some of the bigger plays, uh, which is more like B2B, like the reason that those I think have an interesting opportunity is like data center businesses in general are like quite, like if you go rewind, like, I don't know, even a year ago or two years ago, like data center businesses are really exciting because like the internet is a validated market. Like there's stable cash flows that like are pretty predictable and like it just sees like steady growth. And I think like inside of crypto, it's really funny because I think like not many ecosystems have like stable cash flows. Like ironically, Pudgy Penguins uh, having like their Walmart sales, honestly, is probably going to generate more revenue than like most projects in crypto. <laughs> and like, I think there is something really fascinating about saying like, look, if you can monetize the like the GPUs of the Fal- like the tens of thousands of GPUs of the Falcoin network and get like the hundreds of millions of dollars that's currently flowing into like AI valuations into the Falcoin economy, like then it sort of supercharges every other thing, right? Like, once you have like storage fighters with like tons of money coming in, they can start investing in like, or like even the DeFi stuff, if they want to like, like borrow against those cash flows, if they want to be able to like build up more uh, or like reinvest in their hardware, like DeFi has a natural answer to like, why should it exist? Because like the same way that Wall Street doesn't exist for the sake of flipping like, I don't know, stocks around, it's really for companies to raise capital. People also flip stock, like stocks around as well, but like the primary thing for Wall Street is like help businesses raise capital and improve like the capital markets. I think there's like a story where it's like, yeah, all of these businesses, which are data centers effectively, like if they have cash flows and if you sort of have the ability to offer better financing and all this other stuff, um, I think there's like a really interesting narrative for the Filecoin like economy that could sort of like be built up around that. Um, so yeah, I, like, I think the way it's going to happen for what it's worth is going to look like, I don't imagine most, at least in the next two years that like most companies are necessarily getting a crypto wallet. Uh, I think a lot of what's going to be interesting are these teams that basically are like, basically like white labeling the Filecoin network where they are sort of like the place where you drop a credit card behind the scenes. This team is going to then like go do the work of like getting the data on the network. There'll be the cash flows that are like converting into crypto to like make the payments to the storage fighters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, But I think like that sort of thing, like the benefit for those startups is like they will have access to way more data center space than that they would be able to build out on their own if they were trying to build a competitive Dropbox tomorrow, you know? Like Mm. they have taken what would both be a software and a hardware problem and turned it just into a software problem with like a hardware scale out. Um, So I think there is like a really compelling like pathway. It's really just about like, how do we focus each other as like an ecosystem on like what are the most valuable problems? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's super interesting. Yeah. And it really just goes back to like this, this, this superpower we have of like just having this physical infrastructure. And then now the, now the question is really just like, how do we, how do we kind of align everybody and just get, you know, get the right, the right applications and software tooling, et cetera, being built on top of this. Um, And then, One other kind of, I guess on the AI point, uh, I mean, you talked about kind of AI from just from a practical kind of monetization, you know, GPU usage perspective, but kind of even from more of like the philosophical perspective of, you know, just over the last year with AI boom, we've just, you know, we've all been exposed to, we've all seen these tools in action, we know how they work, et cetera. And I think, at least for me, like I've just seen these concepts that like we used to only talk about in like Filecoin land where it's like verifiability and immutability of data. And these it's kind of like very like jargony, like Filecoin jargon type of terms. And now it's like, it's not that hard to like communicate like why these things are important to, to the average person, right? Uh, if you're seeing deep fakes and just kind of also, you know, fake media or, or, or content or whatever. And just kind of, I'd love to get your perspective on how, how do you see this sort of, you know, this, this sort of AI, generative AI boom, like really kind of, you know, helping to kind of prove out the Filecoin thesis for like, why, why do we need something like this? Like, why does this need to exist to sort of, you know, uh, you know, maybe protect it, help, help us understand like what is actually real and what's not. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think it's an interesting question. So at the end of the day, I think the thing that Filecoin, I mean, I, I'll, I'll broaden it to IPFS. I guess like 
The thing that's really interesting is a lot of the problems that I think AI asks or raises as questions come down to the fact that most of the way that the web is sort of built is on social trust, whether we, like the root of the thing is like social trust, where it's like, it's not always clear what the provenance is and like, you can't really trace stuff. And so you're sort of assuming that, and like, this is what led to like misinformation and fake news and all of that stuff. Um, I think like, I wouldn't claim that IPFS and Filecoin are a panacea for that sort of thing, but I think it gives us one tool in the toolkit that helps solve the problem. Um, I'll give an example with like C2PA is a thing that Adobe has been working on, which is like a standard for like content provenance. And it uses content addressing like under the hood where like you can basically say like for this file, like who made the edits to the file? What was the history? You can roll back. And like this is sort of like native things that fall out of the way that IPFS thinks about the world. Um, And like, again, these are just good distributed systems ideas. It's not like, oh yeah, like like, I, I think it like is validating in the sense that a lot of the things that we thought early on were going to be right, I think are sort of like being borne out. I also think you can sort of look forward and see other things that people have been talking about, which are like increasingly picking up sort of like steam. Um, So yeah, like on the content provenance side, I think like that stuff, it's interesting to see that there was already work in progress and we've seen that sort of pay off a little bit as like people are now asking these questions more and more. Um, I think things like UCANs, um, which like the vision team is working on sort of as like, uh, like a user controlled form of auth where like, instead of having an authentication server, which is sort of like how the web typically works where there's like some central server, which determines like, does this user have the right to read X, Y, Z piece of data? Um, instead using sort of like these JWT like tokens where you can basically sign rights into the token and then hand that around. The reason that's super interesting, I mean, there's two reasons for it. One is it works uh, where like I can like reassign my right to read some piece of data to you. And then you can go to some third party and say like, hey, look, I have this little ticket. I can go read this data. Um, that's cool from like a, like removing me as like a middleman every time you want to read a piece of data, like you can have my like reassigned right. But also it's interesting from like, if you have eight AI agents that are being like spun up. So like, imagine you have a program that creates a new program that doesn't exist. Like you can actually think about how should authentication work in that world. So like, as we are looking towards like AI assistance and more powerful like forms of what AI will be able to do using cryptographic primitives as like the bounding constraint, not like centrally managed servers as like the bounding constraint is actually a better way of designing these systems. And like, you can find blog posts from people, not even inside of the web three community that are slowly coming to this conclusion as well. Um, so like, I think a lot of the things that people have been talking about in this space, it sounded sci-fi, it sounded a little bit futuristic, but they were always good ideas. And I think AI is like helping make that much more tangible to people rather than like the abstract and the theoretical, um, which I think is like, I think good indications by no means does it mean that like the default state of the internet is that we move that direction. But I think it's like, we have the right proof points. It's on all of us to like really lean in to like actually manifest an internet that's like more secure and like, uh, yeah, respecting of like user agency, et cetera. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, we're just about out of time here, but, uh, we'd love to just get, you know, your final thoughts, um, anything else you want to talk about here or address, uh, or address to the community at large. And then we'd just love to get some final thoughts from you on like, what are you most excited about over the next six months, six, 12 months in uh, Filecoin land? Yeah, I mean, so in the next, call it, yeah, like, I don't know, between six and 12 months, as you said, there's a lot of new things that are coming. So people have been working on retrieval markets for a bit, which is like, Saturn is one form of that. There's other retrieval markets like Titan, and there's a few others that are in the works. But retrieval markets is sort of a category that brings hot, like super hot, sort of like CDN style storage to the network. I think it's really exciting because it expands the aperture of what the Filecoin network can serve. Um, and I think like thinking about what are the types of applications that people would build if you had a distributed CDN is like an interesting prospect. Cause I think there are different types of things that aren't possible today that are more possible in the future. Um, compute is another really interesting one. As I mentioned, there's teams like the IO Netfit folks, there's folks like Jensen, people who are thinking about like, how do we monetize like the GPUs of the Filecoin network? Um, I think there's like two forms of which I would encourage people to think. One is like, what are the complementary services uh, that can sort of like, 
if you knew that like there are teams that are going to be sprinting at getting web two AI companies to like basically make use of these GPUs, what are the sort of like add-on services that you would build as offerings that can like help accelerate and improve those offerings? Um, I think that's like a call to action I would maybe put out there. And then the last one is subnets. Where like we haven't really talked about uh, sort of like the vision for Filecoin and scalability. Um, I think like uh, if people haven't heard of IPC, uh, interplanetary consensus, I would encourage people to go to IPC.space and go read the white paper. Um, that too is coming probably in like the next six months or so. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see the different types of subnets. Like I know there's already early teams that are thinking about different things like databases that could be their own subnets or like different types of compute frameworks that you might run as their own subnets. And so I think like in terms of expanding both like the UX, I think there's opportunities there for teams that are thinking about like what would a new wallet look like in these types of experiences or even just thinking about what types of applications would you build if you could get Web2 scalability, but be able to run it through crypto rails. Um, I think there's like a lot of different things that are worth, uh, especially like new builders in a bear market, like considering, because especially in a bull market, I think this is where we're gonna really start see set or seeing separation. Um, ultimately what makes like this hardware space really fascinating is like, you can't really fake it. Like, if you tried running, like, Filecoin miners in AWS, it would be, like, incredibly unprofitable. And, like, the entire thesis is really, like, can you make this stuff, like, play where, like, you can grow and expand and, like, get your margins cheap enough that, like, you are competitive with the cloud. Um, and, like, I think this is where, especially as you start seeing, like, CDNs and some of these other features come online, we're hopefully going to see more differentiation because, yeah, like, even if someone was trying to build a competitive thing that like, I don't know, faked having a CDN or distribution of the same scale, like you'll have to play or pay like a Cloudflare tax or like an Akamai tax. And like inherently like those things will not be sustainable, I would argue. Um, so I think it's like a really interesting opportunity. The teams that are working on these problems are trying to solve really hard problems. Um, but I think this is where like, it's worth thinking about like, what are things that are not possible today that if you knew like how the world was evolving in the next six to 12 months, like what would you go build? Yeah, very well put, very well put. Um, well, JV, really appreciate your time here. Um, if, if folks wanna get in touch, what's the best way to find you? Uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter at, <laughs> uh, it's Jonathan Victor with no vowels, uh, J-N-T-H-N-V-C-T-R. Um, yeah, uh, feel free to give me a follow. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for listening to DWeb Decoded and we will see you next time. Thanks.